you did with uh, with Penumbra yes. and the cheetah study, which you know I, I was not using at all. So again, congratulations on all the amazing work you do, and for um, you know, and for, for dedicating an hour of your time to us. We really are honored to have you on. Well, wonderful. I mean, I, I appreciate you, you guys having me, and uh, you know, uh, I love talking all things thrombus related. So this is uh, <laughs> whether it be in the coronaries or in the peripheral vessels. But uh, right. acute ischemia is uh, something that you guys should know, and and all of my disclosures really relate to thrombus related work that I've been doing in the development of catheters and uh, technologies all designed to make our lives easier with regards to getting rid of clots. So um, there may be some uh, talk about some of these things. But, you know, when we talk about uh, acute limb ischemia, I think there are some important things you guys need to understand. As fellows, uh, there's these so-called six classic P's of acute limb ischemia. Uh, there's uh, uh, pain, pallor, poikilothermia, pulselessness, and then, you know, two late findings, paresthesias and paralysis. So once you've gotten these two, uh, at this point, you're thinking that this patient has had a prolonged uh, 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 case here. Uh, uh, you know, so you're, so you're having ischemic neuropathy or, or ischemic myonecrosis, and the risk of amputation goes up significantly once you get to these levels. So this is something that I want you guys to really uh, focus on. Uh, and, you know, when you get... Uh, called with a patient, uh, you're, uh, you're on call and a patient has a, a cold limb, the, treat, it, treat it like a STEMI in many ways because there's this golden time window of six hours, you know, longer than that you would allow a STEMI to go, but this is the time window before this irreversible neuromuscular damage. And then the amputation rates going up from there go anywhere between six to 20%. So six uh, percent of uh, revascularization is formed within 12 hours of the onset and then up to 12 percent if it's within 12 to 24 hours and then over 20 percent uh, amputation rate if it's uh, done after a day and you can imagine at that point too uh, the, 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 there's a lot of consequences that will come and which we'll talk about and this is also an important point too that the mortality associated with this is just like that of AMI. So 6 to 12 percent. Ken Oriel reported this out way back in 1998. And, you know, this is a, something that I don't think people recognize uh, that this condition can be very deadly, just as deadly as all the coronary cases that we're doing. So what are the etiologies? Everyone thinks about AFib, but the reality is primary thrombotic events. So inside to thrombosis is the most common cause of, uh, of, uh, of acute limb. Now, Certainly during the pandemic in, in New York, you know, during uh, 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 the COVID uh, pandemic, there were a lot more thrombotic uh, events that did occur. And, uh, you know, so some of these numbers did shift around a little bit. But when we look at embolic phenomenon, it's only 15%. But of those 15% of embolic cases, the vast majority, 80%, are cardioembolic. Uh, there are certainly other etiologies like trauma and vasculitis and external compression, but those are a lot more rare. So what do you want to do imaging wise too? So first line is going to be an arterial duplex. And why do that? Because it's very easy. You can do it, even, you know, you can do it at bedside. You can do it yourself, in fact, uh, and if, especially for those of you that carry around a, an ultrasound probe. Uh, it gives you a lot of information right up front, tells you what's going on, tells you what's patent or not. I mean, is the uh, distal vasculature open? Because there's a big difference uh, between a, uh, a leg that has uh, monophasic or patent flow in the tibial vessels as opposed to one with no flow at all. And, uh, and there's no contrast, there's no, uh, uh, there's, there's no real risk to the patient by doing this first line. Second line I would say is CTA and sometimes we'll do that for case planning and uh, especially if you want to know whether or not there's an involvement up in the aorta and whatnot too. Uh, maybe uh, give you some idea of of, uh, of uh, anatomy if there's graphs involved and things like that too. So that can certainly be helpful. But the problem is, you know, the patient is going to get a dye load of 100 cc's, and especially if you're going to be taken to the to the lab to do a procedure, you know, you have an increased risk of renal failure and other uh, complications uh, related to that. Um, but it does give you good definition, and it can be helpful, and it's pretty quick too. Uh, things like MRA really have no real role in the acute limb phenomena or po population because uh, it, just the time involved too and also uh, uh, you know, patient discomfort and whatnot too. I think that uh, there have been people doing some interesting things with uh, 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 gadolinium for, uh, as a novel contrast agent 
uh, but not really in the setting of uh, uh, MRI or MRA. So um, uh, this is, I think, an important slide for you all to remember, the Rutherford classification. Now, you may all remember the Rutherford classification uh, one through six for, uh, for uh, patients with chronic limb ischemia, uh, but acute limb ischemia also has its own Rutherford scale, and this refers uh, to uh, a one to three staging system. So a uh, Rutherford one acute limb patient is one that has a limb that's viable that's not immediately threatened. So that's a patient that may have good collaterals uh, after uh, uh, an occlusion event, so there's no muscle weakness, no sensory loss. Audio, uh, you know, the, the arterial and venous signals are audible. Now, a threatened limb, and this is where I think it's important to, uh, to delineate between, between the two, uh, you have a Rutherford 2A and 2B. So Rutherford 2A is minimal sensory loss. There's no muscle weakness. The arterial signals are, are usually inaudible, but the venous signals are audible. So this is a patient that an endo, uh, endovascular first approach is is very reasonable. Now, Rutherford 2B, this is a patient that's immediately threatened, and if you're able to open them up right away, they'll do well. Uh, but there's more sensory loss. There may be some early uh, 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 motor issues. So this is a neuro, uh, neuromotor problem, okay? So this is a very high level, as I told you from the previous slide, uh, type of situation where if you delay this too much, you're gonna have an increased risk of amputation. So the uh, uh, arterial signals are inaudible, venous signals are still audible. So uh, there's a lot of surgeons out there who will advocate that R2B patients should be taken to the OR and done from an open approach. And now I will argue, and this is something that's gonna be coming out, I think uh, within some of uh, the uh, more recent data, the STRIDE trial just recently closed, hopefully will show uh, that some of these patients uh, can benefit from an endovascular first approach. But if you're going to do endo first with this too, you have to be prepared to open. You also have to be uh, 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 prepared to do a comprehensive uh, thrombectomy on these patients because if you leave clot behind here too, uh, this can increase the risk of amputation. Now, a Rutherford 3 patient, and this is also very important to recognize, is a non-salvageable limb. So this is a patient that has irreversible uh, damage, tissue loss, extensive muscle damage. Uh, there's just profound anesthesia, paralysis. Uh, I mean, the, you can literally have rigor mortis and the, the, the leg may not be movable. And at this point, the only option is amputation. So if you don't amputate this leg, the patient can actually die from sepsis, from uh, just from the uh, profound rhabdomyolysis and renal failure and all the other complications that go with that. So if you recognize that the patient has a non-viable limb, that limb needs to be amputated. And this patient will have no arterial or venous signals at all. So what about initial treatment? So you wanna start heparin to avoid clot extension and propagation. And this is an important concept. Remember, heparin does not dissolve thrombus. That's your body's autologous fibrolytic mechanisms. Heparin prevents clot progression or extension. So uh, that's the reason why we start anticoagulation. Pain control is important. Uh, you want to improve perfusion, so you may want to keep the foot dependent and avoid heel pressure because you can get necrosis. Uh, warming blankets, this is something I use quite a bit. I like to use a half-sheet bear hugger to try to help with vasodilatation, uh, and it does seem to have some improvement uh, uh, and even some symptomatic improvement. You want to maximize oxygenation, uh, especially tissue oxygenation, and correct hypotension, but you want to try to avoid vasopressors as much as possible because they themselves can pro uh, propagate the acute limb event. You know, we've had cases of patients who've had insight to thrombosis just from uh, severe vasospasm from vasopressors. So in those kind of patients, I think, you know, if you can maximize the hypotension by correcting with volume uh, and then minimize the use of vasoconstrictors as much as possible. So uh, from a management standpoint, uh, you know, historically speaking, surgical embolectomy was the preferred route, and this involved uh, direct clot removal. Uh, you might have to do it from multiple uh, access points, uh, like the, the common femoral artery, the popliteal artery, and even potentially distal within the tibial vessels. The advantage of this, too, is it allows for direct clot removal. You can pass a Fogarty catheter, which is essentially a balloon tip catheter with no wire port, and it's very atraumatic, and you can pull the clot out directly. The problem is, if done without angiography, you may be leaving clot behind. So 
Uh, there's an issue with incomplete thrombus resolution. There are some surgeons who advocate for uh, a hybrid approach with uh, open embolectomy, but also do it in a vascular lab or cath lab so you can actually do a runoff angiography from the direct access that you've made into the artery. Uh, if you combine this with uh, thrombolytic, you can do a uh, uh, um, uh, catheter-rectal thrombolysis, uh, um, uh, uh, but some people will just do CDT by itself without surgery. And the nice thing about CDT is it does address some of the microvascular thrombus. Uh, and also there's a, a higher risk of, of bleeding. So bleeding rates have been reported outwards of around 10% uh, in multiple studies. There's also the cost of elytics uh, and the risk associated with systemic bleeding, as I mentioned, but also intracranial hemorrhage. So any patient that has had previous uh, uh, bleeding in the brain is absolutely contraindicated to have thrombolytics. And you guys are familiar with the, 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 the restrictions for, for, for those types of drugs. Uh, but uh, you also have to understand that if a patient ends up with thrombolytics and uh, uh, you don't have outflow, you're just continuing the ischemia. So there's delayed resolution of uh, the thrombosis and also increased risk of compartment syndrome, which we'll talk about. Pharmacomechanical thrombectomy combines a little bit of the best of both worlds. You're using a lot less thrombolytic, there's lower infusion marination time, and then also there's less bleeding risk as a result. So you combine mechanical thrombectomy and at the same time also marinating uh, the clot with a little bit of thrombolytic, which allows you to soften it out and make it easier to remove. Uh, and then depending on the devices used, uh, uh, there's a lot less uh, 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 um, time involved. You may put four to six milligrams of TPA directly into the artery, perhaps using an infusion catheter and then go in and spray it out. And then, of course, catheter embolectomy or thrombectomy. And the advantage here, too, is that you can use nolytics to do direct clot removal. But this is at the expense of, uh, of blood loss. So an important concept to understand is reperfusion syndrome. So these patients who present late uh, are at highest risk for this, or those who have delayed thrombus resolution. So if you see, for example, see a clot and just drop a lytics catheter, but don't establish flow, then uh, there's an increased risk for this as well, too, because uh, prolonged ischemia uh, results in cell damage, and then you have more uh, rhabdomyolysis. The cells, they start to swell up, uh, and then you get the profound edema, uh, erythema. Uh, the leg, as it swells, can cause compartment syndrome. So a patient with a late presentation, you want to do serial uh, 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 calf and thigh circumference measurements, uh, to make sure that, uh, that there is no signs of reperfusion syndrome. And the treatment for this is urgent fasciotomy. So if you recognize a patient is starting to develop this, you want to call one of your surgical colleagues to perform fasciotomy as soon as possible, because if you don't do this, you'll have an increased risk of neuromuscular damage uh, or even worse, uh, uh, limb loss and amputation. So this is uh, what it looks like, and you can see how beefy the muscle is. Typically, what they'll do is uh, they'll uh, leave this open, put a wound back on, wait for the swelling to come down, and then do delayed closure. But by doing this, you really release the compartments and allow that muscle to, to remain viable during this acute process. There will be a certain amount of muscle death just related to the reperfusion, but hopefully you're able to preserve the patient's ability to walk. So what about technologies that are out there, too? So there's a lot of different ones, too, that range from as I mentioned, the catheter-directed thrombolysis technologies, mechanical thrombectomy systems, uh, but with direct extraction, uh, aspiration, uh, both powered and manual. So I'd like to just cover a few different things so you guys are familiar. And you'll see that there's a lot of different technologies depending on where you end up. Uh, the ECOS device is probably one of the oldest ones. There's a new version that's a double-headed version used for PE, but um, typically you'll only need one of these heads if you're doing an acute limb case comes with multiple treatment links and essentially allows you to uh, deliver thrombolytic, but at the same time also use ultrasound. I find that these devices actually do work, uh, especially within uh, prosthetic grafts. Uh, it does seem, and this is purely anecdotal, that the ultrasonic energy interacts with the graft material and allows for perhaps better uh, lytic penetration and, and lysis. So I think there is still a role for this type of thing even in the modern era of mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that if there is no flow distally, you are still ischemic. So 
if you're going to put something like this into, you want to establish some outflow first and then go ahead and use this uh, type of device because I think it will increase the efficacy of your treatment. Uh, Realytic therapy, this is the AngioJet device, something that we used to use quite a bit previously before some of the newer technologies. It uh, does allow you to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, power pulse spray a, a TPA directly into the clot weight uh, and let it marinate and then go in and do a mechanical thrombectomy. The A-French uh, catheter is available as well too with a large port. Uh, the nice thing about this device is that it also does a really good maceration. So for a very organized clot, uh, this shoots out very powerful saline jets and then uh, essentially uh, via the Venturi effect, you know, you have uh, 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 um, these saline jets that circulate back and then uh, you, you have passive aspiration. So it's not active aspiration. This, uh, uh, this concept allows for some uh, weak level removal of clot, but really the, the biggest strength of this system is primarily in the maceration capabilities. Now, the reason why I don't really love using this device is because since it shoots out these saline jets forward, this uh, can actually, in fact, cause clot to embolize more distally. So if you're, say, working with an, an SFA and you start uh, uh, macerating, you can actually shoot that clot down distally. Uh, for, in, for practical purposes, it works very well, uh, but uh, you just have to recognize that as a potential complication. Uh, there are other devices that have since uh, come out too. Uh, uh, they are combination hybrid, hybrid thromboatherectomy systems. And in fact, this device does have a hybrid indication uh, and uh, uh, that utilizes a, a rotating head with kind of almost like a side cutter. And uh, this uh, uh, rotating helix or Archimedes screw actually allows you to remove athero, atheroma and thrombotic material. Uh, this may be really good for mixed morphology. So if you have a patient that has uh, both significant plaque but also a, a, a column of thrombus uh, within a, 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 a maybe a, a chronic limb ischemia situation, something like this may be actually quite useful, uh, especially if you recognize it as you're crossing the lesion with your wire. And you can see this is an example uh, provided by BD uh, of utilization of the system. This is a new system that I've actually been working on for a while now. Um, we're actually working on the Venus version of this. This is the, the WOLF system. Uh, and this is a very unique system where it uses uh, end block clot removal. It's got this uh, nitinol sleeve that ingests thrombus. Now, this type of system is very good for, I think, organized type clot. But the problem with this system is that uh, it's not going to be great uh, if you have a lot of soft, liquidy thrombus. So this type of system would make a lot more sense when you have something that's very hard, very organized, embolic clot, perhaps, and you can see that it has a much greater ingestion force over other aspiration systems, even the giant 24 French flow retriever, which is used in the venous space. So uh, that's because you're, you're, you have a lot more pull force. You're actually pulling this type of material out. So in, in situations where we've had uh, embolic uh, stuff like from fungal elements or uh, uh, even malignancy clot, uh, some of that material is very hard, almost the consistency of bone. Uh, these types of systems may actually have a lot more uh, uh, utility over pure aspiration. And so uh, you can see this is an example shared by George Adams. Uh, this is actually a chronic patient crossed through with the system. You can see the type of material that was pulled out, very organized material, which you typically would have a difficult time doing with a traditional aspiration system. Um, this is a new system that's come to market as well, too, and there are, are going to be several devices that you'll see that utilize the concept of basket embolectomy. Uh, and so uh, a lot of these stent treber like technologies came from the brain space. Um, it's nice because there's no rotor units, a simple funnel design, uh, and uh, uh, you can use it in uh, uh, peripheral vessels. It combines this receiving basket with two additional uh, coring baskets as well too. And you can see this is what it looks like as it captures the thrombus and pulls it through. You may have to do multiple uh, uh, passes uh, but theoretically, more organized material should be able to be removed as well. And you can see in this example, patient with a, a acute limb, total occlusion pre, post uh, uh, crossing with, uh, with uh, the pounce device after two passes. You end up with very nice results. And you can see the final results post DCB look quite good. And this is the material that's pulled out there too. Very organized, chronic elements as well too, which is very typical of what you would see 
with AFib type thrombus. So what about manual aspiration? This is something that you guys will see quite a bit of uh, used as well because it's simple, it's easy. I mean, people try to use export as well too for a while in the legs, which obviously doesn't work because the catheter size is really just too small. Uh, and the clot that we're dealing with is, is much too great. Uh, the limitations of manual aspiration compared to powered aspiration is that as blood fills the syringe, you have a rapid drop off in the vacuum force. And so this is a very common concept with all manual aspiration systems. So you can see over a period of about 15 seconds or so, you'll lose all of your aspiration force if the syringe is filling with blood. If you compare that to any powered aspiration system that's out there, as long as you're able to uh, supply power to your pump, you're able to maintain pure vacuum. And there's a lot of different systems out there too. Uh, Quick Clear is a battery powered device. Of course, uh, you guys are familiar with Indigo and the Lightning system as well too, seven, eight, and 12. There'll be the new 16 coming out in about a week or so. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the Jedi system as well too, which uh, combines uh, 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 fragmentation with this powerful saline jet to macerate with aspiration as well too. So potentially uh, a combination of two technologies to allow for removal of more organized type material. Uh, this is the engine pump, something that we use quite a bit of too, but there are other systems out there as well too, able to maintain pure vacuum. And there are multiple catheters available as well too. And you can see that even the tiny cat three catheter has more aspiration force or efficiency than even the eight friends Zelante catheter. So recognize that the larger the catheter, the shorter the length, the more efficient or powerful the aspiration efficiency. So what about cost? And this is something we unfortunately have to think about as well too. When you think about what we used to do with dropping a Lytics catheter for you know, one to two days, uh, the cost of the ICU stay and the amount of TPA utilized uh, is not instant. And then if you take a look, if you combine it with say, uh, or rather if you do an alternative procedure with just aspiration thrombectomy, you're talking about uh, um, spending only about $5,000 and not having to do an ICU stay afterwards. And you can potentially nix the lytic altogether. Uh, if you also look at reimbursement from a hospital standpoint, they, they like you a lot more when you uh, avoid doing TPA because mechanical thrombectomy reimburses in a much higher DRG group as opposed to just a straight thrombolysis. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's a role for both uh, technologies, uh, maybe even a combination, but from an economic standpoint too, mechanical thrombectomy is currently favored. When we talk about uh, 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 technique, and this, is, uh, this applies to all aspiration systems out there, you go as big as you possibly can. And uh, the reason why is that um, uh, the, the larger the catheter, the more powerful uh, uh, the, the aspiration efficiency. And uh, if you look at the, the, the CAT6 catheter, which is a two millimeter size catheter, over say the CAT8, which is significantly bigger, so you know, 2.67 millimeters, you know, CAT8 is 150% the power of CAT6. Uh, there's a new uh, Lightning 7 catheter, which is 144% the power of CAT6. So essentially get the same benefits of the CAT8 with a seven French uh, form factor. Uh, this is also another important concept as well too. It's called the extract technique. Uh, it's, a, it's a, a modification of the adapt technique used in stroke intervention. Uh, you can see this is a, a, an eight French destination sheath. You can certainly do this with a seven French system as well. Uh, and then the idea is that you would go in with the catheter, sit on the clot for at least 90 seconds, especially for discrete emboli, allow it to digest into the catheter, and then pull it out of the body under continuous aspiration. And then when you get to the valve, ideally you have a removable or deflatable valve. With the destination sheaths, you can uh, just remove the valve and pull out the clot intact. And this is uh, a, a really nice way to remove uh, discrete embolic uh, debris. Uh, if you have extensive thrombus, sometimes it gets cumbersome to use this technique, and that's when you use separator-like devices or other agitators to help break up the thrombus. Uh, now, uh, you can also do this with, uh, as I mentioned, a deflatable valve system. So there's the dry seals out there too. So if you're gonna use a larger catheter, like a 12 French catheter, you can use that with a pre-closed technique and, and be able to remove uh, clot uh, uh, intact. So I wanna show a few cases in our remaining time here too. So these are a few different scenarios. We talked a lot about legs, but certainly other parts of the body are also at risk for limb uh, ischemia as well. This is a patient presenting with subacute arm thrombosis. 
uh, she had actually uh, uh, you know, had uh, neuromotor issues for almost three days. So this is a, a Rutherford 2B patient. So high risk for limb loss. You can see we have an extensive clot in the brachial artery. I've gone up here now uh, with a seven French destination sheath, a seven by 90. Important if you can do arm cases to make sure you have a sheath that's well beyond the vertebral artery to avoid the risk of stroke. So if you're gonna do these cases, you have to make sure that you stay beyond the vertebral artery. It's gonna, if, if the clot's gonna embolize, it's gonna go down the arm. It's not gonna re uh, reflux back up to the brain. But you certainly don't wanna drag clot past the vertebral artery and risk embolization. So uh, parking the catheter distally allows you to, to do it safely. And then the first thing we do is we go ahead and we aspirate out the clot within the brachial artery very easily. This is readily done. You see with nice restoration of flow. Next, you see we have a very discrete clot down there uh, in the distal brachial artery. Uh, and then extending into both the radial and the ulnar branches. So uh, you can see it's a pretty discrete cutoff here. I'm going down with the CAT6 device. Now with uh, the, seven, uh, uh, the Lightning 7 catheter, you can certainly do this as well. Uh, but sometimes the vessel is too small. Notice the dye here. Uh, the dye is actually coming back with the catheter as we're aspirating. This is the uh, extract technique. And you can see we've removed the valve. We pull the clot out intact. It's like fishing. So this clot is at the end of the catheter. It's like, you know, the little worm on a stick. So uh, you can see now after having done that, uh, we end up with complete resolution and uh, restoration of flow. So pulling that one plug out restored the three vessel uh, uh, runoff to the hand there too. So uh, the, uh, the ulnar uh, uh, radial and interosseous branches. Uh, this patient, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, she uh, left uh, against medical advice because she wanted to go smoke. So uh, her outcome uh, was not as good. Uh, and actually, she presented back with uh, reperfusion syndrome and had a fasciotomy. And after the fasciotomy, she never smoked again. Here's another case. This is a massive thrombosis case. This is a patient who's 85, syncopal fall, facial hematoma, trauma, CT with old strokes. Patient's right leg has been cold now for uh, over three days. So this is, a, uh, again, also a, uh, a R2B patient. Uh, there's numbness, coolness, muscle weakness. Uh, this patient is at risk for becoming a, a Rutherford 3 case and just needing a frank amputation. But if you have this level of occlusion, amputation at the level of the hip may be fatal. Uh, the patients just don't tolerate it very well. Uh, the other problem here, too, is that this is not a thrombolytics case at all. Patients had facial trauma, uh, has old strokes. This is a patient that's high risk for bleeding. So we don't wanna give thrombolytics. Um, so what do you do in this kind of scenario too? You have a flush occlusion of the right common iliac artery. Uh, you can see that uh, we're trying to go up and over here. It's not crossing. So you can do a, a few different approaches. You can certainly come from the arm or above and try to poke through that way. But in this particular scenario, I actually used ultrasound and access the occluded common femoral artery. And from the right side, it went up uh, this is actually uh, before we had the seven friend system. This is using the six friend system and utilizing the separator. The separator is a little uh, bead uh, on a wire that allows you to agitate the clot and break it up into smaller pieces so that it can be easily aspirated. And after having done that, you can see we now have a landing zone in the right common iliac artery. And now I'm able to go up and over with my catheter and then start performing aspiration down through the common and external iliac artery. I close the access site in the common Ferrari with an external vascular closure device. And then you can see I have restoration of flow through the SFA. We have clot all the way down through the uh, SFA. And so I go ahead and I take the catheter all the way down here with restoration of flow. And then you can see there's also clot distally in the tibial vessels as well. And this is where I actually take the six French uh, uh, cat six catheter. You can see I'm taking it all the way down to the tibio tailor joint without difficulty. There's no wire. These are very atraumatic catheters. You can use a wire if you need to, but it just takes up aspiration lumen. So the nice thing about this is that you can track it very well and then also uh, improve your aspiration efficiency. After this, you can see we have restoration of single vessel runoff. This patient actually did well. She did not have reperfusion syndrome uh, and she uh, did not have any uh, uh, amputation. She uh, ended up uh, uh, leaving the hospital after about 48 hours and was maintained on a, a DOAC afterwards. Um, this is a, a, a final case I wanted to, uh, to show you. Uh, this is a patient uh, who uh, had COVID, uh, uh, presented with a hemorrhagic stroke 
likely related to uh, uh, COVID sequelae, uh, seven days prior, uh, he was in the hospital and during his hospitalization developed uh, acute modeling of, the, uh, of, of both the limbs up to his abdomen. So uh, CT showed extensive aortic thrombus going down both legs with bilateral occlusion. So this is a, an extremely high risk situation. And uh, if you were to try to approach this from an open uh, approach, you would have to do multi-level uh, uh, open catheter embolectomy procedures, common thermal going up bilaterally into the aorta, and then flipping around and going down, and then also potentially popliteal axis and maybe even tibial axis as well. So I, I opted to try to uh, uh, do this uh, from a percutaneous approach, and this is kind of a, a little more advanced maneuver. Uh, but I essentially did pre-close bilaterally uh, and ended up uh, um, uh, um, going on both sides. So that's the Lightning 12 catheter with a 12 French dry seal. Uh, so I cleared out the uh, uh, aortic thrombus and the iliac thrombus on both sides. And then you can see afterwards the type of clot that comes out. This is very different from what we would typically see uh, in uh, most acute limb cases prior to COVID. The clot is a lot more rubbery, a lot more organized, a lot more difficult to digest into aspiration catheters. So what I find with COVID type thrombus is that you have to go bigger uh, because the traditional aspiration catheters will, will fail. So I went actually up and over uh, as I pre-closed the other side and went down the SFA and the profunda, cleared out the profunda and the SFA, ended up getting a nice result there, and then went all the way down into the tibials. I had to switch out for the lightning catheter and after that, too, I was able to restore two vessel runoff distally there. So you can see the perineal and the PT is open. So I went ahead and, uh, and closed my axis site from the, uh, the left side because uh, I pre-closed it. And then I went up and over, did the exact same thing. And you can see uh, this is uh, the Lightning 12 catheter going down. I'm rotating the catheter. Uh, and I'm ingesting the clantigrade. Uh, and also, when I, I pull it back retrograde as well, too. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting a, a, a maximal wall uh, uh, opposition. So by, because the catheter is angled, it will pour up against the wall. The tip is very also atraumatic. And you can see I'm able to take it without a wire. So after this, you can see that the SFA looks reasonable. Actually, I was able to take it down right to that TP trunk. And uh, you know the outer diameter of the CAT-12 catheter is 4.04 millimeters. So uh, if you have a large enough uh, vessel, you can accommodate it. And you can see we end up with a reasonable runoff, essentially single vessel runoff uh, with, uh, with uh, collateralization. And uh, we end up with a fairly nice result. And this is pretty impressive. You know, this is the kind of clot that came out when we, when we uh, took it out of the catheter. It, uh, it's extremely organized, extremely rubbery, and typical aspiration systems would struggle with this. So this is, I show this picture because, you know, it's really important when you have this kind of scenarios that you want to have uh, uh, the largest catheter possible get the job done. And surgical embolectomy also would be a challenge with this type of case too as well. So in summary, uh, acute limb ischemia is both a limb and life-threatening condition. This is something you guys need to recognize early and quickly. Uh, physical examination and ultrasound is typically all you need to offer rapid assessment. Uh, direct uh, removal of thrombus from an endovascular approach is certainly feasible now. And we'll continue to develop new technologies that will make this process a lot easier. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the data is uh, is is still uh, forthcoming uh, regarding an endovascular first approach, but hopefully we'll have some data that we can share with you soon. Uh, reperfusion syndrome is a, a reality, and there are some that advocate for upfront fasciotomy. Uh, in our institution, we typically do it uh, quickly afterwards if necessary. Uh, early identification is important so that you don't end up with limb loss. And, and the other thing, too, is that uh, we didn't talk about it today, but, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, make this process a lot more efficient and limit blood loss. And so there are a lot of technologies. Uh, there's the lightning system. There are other sensor technologies as well, too, that are looking to limit blood loss so that you're just sucking out clot and not blood. Uh, because, obviously, significant blood loss with a large pore system can li really limit your your operative time. And so we're trying to find better ways to do that. And, you know, uh, lightning is one example. There are others out there as well, too. And we're able to uh, reduce our blood loss from, say, about 800 cc's for these aortic cases down to about 100, 150. But it's very technique dependent. 
and you have to do a lot of practice with it to, to become efficient. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and hopefully open it up for any questions that you guys might have. Jay, thank you very much. That was a very elegant and comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much. I do want to also give a shout out to you that not only are you all those amazing things that uh, that uh, Azim mentioned, but I also consider you a personal mentor. Uh, you get a Thank phone you. call from me at least <laughs> once a month about the various clinical questions and uh, you know conundrums that I'm in from time to time. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank so, you. Of course. So I was going to ask you a few questions that are brewing in my mind until till, uh, the chat opens up for other questions. I mean, the chat's open, but you know, I, I don't see any questions yet. But uh, so what is the breakdown of the devices that you use in your own personal practice now that you have, we have so many of them in your armamentarium. So what is the breakdown you use? Well, so for me, I'm a little bit different because I do a lot of testing and development for a number of companies. So I have access to a number of pre-market devices that are not uh, 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 available because, you know, I don't believe any company has really figured out how to do this. Again, uh, just like in the P space, uh, the thrombectomy, uh, the arterial thrombectomy world has advanced far faster than uh, any data can uh, be generated. And, and so, uh, it, you know, I, I think unlike uh, things like PE, where I think there are, uh, 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 or even DVT for that matter, where there's a little controversy, I don't think anybody argues with the importance of acute limb because we know the consequences mm -hmm. of not doing these kind of cases. The question mm -hmm. comes down to whether or not you're going to do surgery versus an endo approach. Uh, but, you know, I do a lot of uh, a penumbra now. I used to, I started off years ago with a lot of uh, uh, Andrew Jet and uh, Ecospace uh, uh, technologies. And uh, but I do a lot less thrombolytic now. My thrombolytics utilization uh, is less than, you know, two or three percent. Um, so I do a direct uh, embolectomy approach or a thrombectomy approach with an aspiration system and most commonly using the indigo system uh, because mm -hmm. I find that the catheters are very atraumatic and they work very well. But there are other catheters out there as well, too. The key is just to become very versatile with with one or more and uh, and be able to use it efficiently. Um, okay. All right. Got it. So, so now I was actually going to ask you that you, you mentioned it, but uh, is there any scenario where you would say you look at a, you know, angiogram and you say, wow, this is a lot of, uh, you know, this is a, a, a lot of thrombus. So, you know, just in, like in the old days, we would drop a lytic catheter and bring them back in 24 hours. Is there any scenario either, you know, before doing anything or after maybe you have residual thrombus or something, you would do such a thing? Well, I think with residual them back thrombus, for, yeah. Yeah, there is definitely still a role for uh, for thrombolysis, but as I mentioned, uh, if you have a total occlusion event and you just drop a lytic catheter, the patient is still ischemic. So at the very least, you need to establish some type of flow, uh, because uh, you know flow is your friend. Flow is the best thrombolytic agent out there, uh, uh, because the body's autologous fibrolytic mechanisms will help uh, dissolve uh, uh, thrombus and help restore flow. But if you're going to enhance it with a thrombolytic, typically either using a balloon or uh, an aspiration catheter need to establish some flow. And if you have significant residual thrombus burden uh, with maybe uh, runoff comp uh, that's compromised, then you drop a lytics catheter uh, to hopefully clean up the, uh, the rest. And maybe you'll have to do an infusion for 6 to 12 hours and not these really ultra-prolonged infusions. Um, I, I, I don't think I've ever just dropped a catheter down. Maybe rarely if the patient had some significant collaterals uh, and you show that the distal vessel is not compromised because of these collaterals, that might be okay to do. But that might be an argument uh, to do a hybrid approach and do pharmacomechanical thrombectomy if aspiration is not going to work. And that where, that's where perhaps with a, a Unifuse or a Craig McNamara catheter, you can instill, you know, five or 10 milligrams of TPA, let it marinate for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then go in and aspirate it out. So that's a, that's a, that's a hybrid approach. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. So I have a few questions in the, in the chat here. One is, uh, uh, what is the uh, medical management after the initial management, whether you use antiplatelets versus uh, DOAX? Well, both? So, 
I think it, it really depends on the etiology as well, too. I think I, I tend to use uh, uh, a lot of uh, Lovenox injections, uh, especially for, you know, if it, with COVID-related thrombus, uh, there definitely seems to be some antiviral activity uh, of uh, of heparinoids, I, I think, with, uh, with, uh, with, with co in COVID cases. But the other thing, too, is that... Uh, uh, you know, even though in the VT world they talk about Lovenox as being the preferred drug, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, sometimes these patients do need to go to the OR if they have to have a fasciotomy, and if they're on heparin, you can turn it off. So that's my bias, but it may not be it may not be correct. If you look uh, from a from a dosing standpoint, uh, 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 a low molecular weight heparin is going to get you therapeutic much faster than any. Uh, uh, you know, IV unfractionated uh, heparin. So uh, that's certainly something that that can be done. Uh, so we use a lot of uh, uh, unfractionated heparin for the first 24 to 48 hours, and then at that point too, I typically will switch over to a DOAC. Now I will use uh, 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 antiplatelets like Plavix, uh, especially if I have to uh, place a stent or do something else like that to in combination. Uh, and so we may do uh, uh, dual therapy with. Plavix and also a DOAC, but also maybe even occasionally triple therapy as well too, if it's the appropriate clinical scenario. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that uh, I think the, um, the Society of Asthma Medicine uh, has written about this before too, especially on the VT side, but even in the acute limb world, there are a number of different dosing regimens and thought processes regarding antiplatelets uh, and medical management afterwards. Uh, and I don't think there's any specific consensus out there too. Um, there's, you know, pe people I think are a little more consistent on the arterial side than on the venous side, but uh, I, I think it's it's a little bit of a dealer's choice, I think, in terms of what you're going to use. There's also now sure. with, with Voyager and Compass, uh, you know, the concept of using a low-dose DOAC as well too, and especially for patients that are not necessarily acute limb, more chronic limb, but do have some thrombus, I think that strategy is a very reasonable one as well too. Got it. Got it. Excellent. All right. So Zane asks uh, that, you know, he um, uh, congratulates you for an excellent session. And he asks that if, uh, how do you maintain an ACT range, especially in a high bleeding range patient, I mean, high bleeding risk patient, and as well as uh, two, if you had to pick two devices of choice uh, to be had in the lab for managing ALI, which would those be? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, my answer may change over the next uh, uh, few years, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, for the high bleeding risk patients, you have to, um, uh, um, you know, pick your battles. So uh, you can't really do these cases without anticoagulation because you'll have in situ thrombosis from the catheters themselves. Uh, and so I think you have to use heparin. The nice thing about heparin is you can turn them off. So I will tend to try to maintain an ACT, uh, you know, in the, in the 250 plus range if possible. Uh, and then I'll deal with bleeding consequences that might happen. And if we have to turn it off afterwards, you know, we have to turn it off. Uh, but uh, uh, we certainly had plenty of patients who were bleeding quite a bit during the pandemic uh, who had all sorts of complications related to that. They were clotting and bleeding. And so that's, a, that's always a struggle. Uh, so I would say for the procedural anticoagulation, I would just do it as you're normally doing because the last thing you want to do is to be chasing your tail because uh, of thrombus that's happening intraprocedurally. So um, that's what I tend to do. Uh, certainly, if you're in a large vessel, you can get away with lower ACTs, even as low as 200, but I st my bias tends to be go a little bit higher. Um, now, afterwards, uh, you could argue about shooting uh, uh, for uh, lower targets. You could certainly use a uh, cardiac dose heparin protocol, you know, like at uh, uh, 12 units per kilo per hour, uh, try to shoot for lower targets if necessary. Uh, because as I mentioned before, if you've got flow, sometimes that's the best uh, anticoagulant that you can have. So you can potentially get away with lower uh, um, uh, levels of anticoagulation. And we've even had some patients where we completely discontinued the anticoagulation and they have actually done okay once we've got rid of the offending uh, occlusion. So, okay. you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, I know it's a convoluted answer, but uh, it's, you're going to base it based off of the patient itself. 
Now, in terms of devices, uh, you know, we've pretty much uh, um, uh, uh, use uh, uh, Indigo now for almost all of our ALI cases. Um, so that, uh, um, you know, that's pretty much the lightning system, uh, uh, w which is uh, our, our go-to choice. And then um, we also will do some ecos as well too. Uh, as I mentioned, prosthetic graphs, uh, there's still a use for that as well. Okay, excellent. So which is a segue to our next question that uh, that Garley, uh, one of our fellows has asked is, you know, what, what is the role of ecos? I guess you mentioned this a little bit, but I guess you can elaborate a bit. Also, yeah. he's asking about uh, the 24 French uh, or smaller uh, flow retriever, uh, you know, in RE systems, do they have any off-label indication in the RTL system and if you ever use them? And also one of the recurrent questions I'm seeing is that, is there any tips and tricks to prevent reperfusion syndrome? Yeah. So, um, uh, so a lot of stuff there too. So uh, with regards mm -hmm. to the, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, 24 French system, uh, I've used that uh, for uh, aortic thrombus, uh even once uh, uh and don't do this uh for for lv thrombus uh, <laughs> it, uh, uh, uh that's uh that's a scary scenario to high risk for stroke because we're not gonna we, we don't we, we, that, that's too much to discuss during this type of uh <laughs> of, 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 of 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 forum uh but uh uh the you know all of the companies are, are working on large core systems we've even done angiovac cases as well too uh, which uh, um, you know for for uh, for vegetations and whatnot too, even in the arterial side. Uh, so there are uh, some uh, uh, roles for these large core systems if you have very large clot. But in general, uh, even the uh, the twelve or even the upcoming sixteen front systems, I think, will be more than adequate to address most of these types of concerns. Um, I. Uh, um, uh, you know, you always worry about blood loss, I think, with the larger catheters. So uh, if you're going to be returning blood, then I guess it's okay. I, I, I also um, have concerns about returning thrombosed blood because does that increase the risk of rethrombosis? And so I think there's some mm -hmm. questions there as well, too. So I try to use as much uh, blood loss mitigation strategies as possible. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, use the largest catheter that you can to get the job job done. Uh, so the other question I think was about when would you use uh, ECOS, I guess, was was, was that one? Uh, we uh -huh. talked about prosthetic. Correct. Correct. And, oh, prosthetic. And, yeah. yeah and, and so that, well, that's, that's, that's what, that's my preference. You can certainly do it uh, uh, in an occluded SFA that you've, you've maybe partially opened up. Maybe there's already some mm -hmm. tibial flow distally. So you can lay a long mm -hmm. gap across it and that will work. But um, I think also, um, uh, you know, mixed morphology type thrombus. I think some people uh, claim that the ultrasonic pressure may help allow for better lytic penetration. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know mm -hmm. if that's entirely true. I think there have been studies that have done that have compared uh, CDT to uh, um, uh, uh, ECOS and really have found no major difference between the two technologies with regards to uh, mm -hmm. plot resolution or efficiency. And uh, and what was the the last question again? I'm sorry. The last question was yeah, if, there any, if there are any <laughs> strategies. <laughs> sorry, I know if there are any strategies to mitigate reperfusion, uh, yeah. reperfusion injury. Yeah. So this is an interesting one too. Uh, a, a lot of this stuff is anecdotal. There's some uh, data out there utilizing mucomist as well to potentially mm -hmm. reduce the free radical damage. I don't know. There's no 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 randomized data out there to support it, but uh, people have done mm -hmm. it. Uh, some people have also uh, done uh, other uh, uh, things like uh, leg elevation as well too uh, to help reduce the swelling. Um, mm -hmm. The big, the best strategy to reduce reperfusion syndrome is just get the clot out as quickly as you can. And and, and exactly, I was going to say, yeah. don't 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 sit on the leg. If you get called about a cold leg, don't say let's start let's heparinize them and I'll see them in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's almost always mm -hmm. the wrong answer. So. Uh, that that's the mm -hmm. reperfusion syndrome typically as long as the patient shows up in a timely fashion is an avoidable complication mm -hmm, mm -hmm. correct correct and uh one more question which is actually an interesting question for your instant thrombosis patients mm -hmm. what is your how, what is your um you know uh, strategy of choice yeah so um uh we're going to be publishing a, about this hopefully soon um mm -hmm. Uh, if for uh, you know, for instant thrombosis or even subacute stent thrombosis, a lot of times you mm -hmm. don't even know uh, 
uh, uh, that this has happened. And this can also happen within mm -hmm. native vessels as well, too. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take your wire and your wire crosses very easily, mm -hmm. uh, it's the mm -hmm. so-called wire test. And so okay. assume that there's soft uh, thrombus, soft clot, or even soft plaque. If you go in and try to do something like atherectomy there too, you will have distal embolization and trash foot. So mm -hmm. in that, in those kind of scenarios, some type of upfront thrombectomy should be done. Uh, I mentioned Rotorex uh, as one option. Some people are using that because it's hybrid thromboatherectomy. You can certainly mm -hmm. do that. Some people have used Jetstream, which also has an aspiration and atherectomy solution, but the aspiration port is, is not that strong. It's very, it's a little bit mm -hmm. weak. Uh, I personally prefer to run uh, an indigo catheter through there first, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which we, this is our so-called laser cat technique. It's technically cat laser, but you go in first mm -hmm. with the indigo catheter, uh, and then you see what you got, and then you typically have a rind of atheroma either within the stent or uh, in a native vessel, and at that point, we'll use laser atherectomy to, uh, uh, but you can use any atherectomy system that you would want, and, and, then, mm -hmm. and then proceed with DCB afterwards. Uh -huh. that, that's interesting. Actually, PK had the same strategy. He would he would actually talk about the wire test too. If it was too easy to cross, then he would always, uh, you know, we would always do a uh, thrombectomy first and then atherectomy. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And do you always use a filter or uh, use no, a filter as uh, much as possible? You, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, the, the filter uh, gives you a false sense of security. Uh, it's mm -hmm. nice if you have it, but typically the amount of thrombus we're talking about overwhelms the filter. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can uh, certainly put one down, um, but uh, a lot of times with these kind of scenarios, I don't even cross the distal edge of the lesion. So there may mm -hmm. be a cap at the end of the lesion that almost acts like a biologic filter. And so you do thrombectomy, mm -hmm. go all the way to the distal lesion, clear out the, the, the vessel, and then cross distally uh, after you've cleared everything out and then aspirate through the end. So. Uh, you know, you can use that uh, distal edge stenosis as a filter, clean out everything above, and then mm -hmm. only finally cross with your aspiration catheter at the end. And then if you need to put a filter down, you can, but a lot of times mm -hmm. you'll find that you don't need it. Okay. All right, excellent. And one more question I actually have is, what, what about, uh, have you ever used uh, any specific kind of uh, thrombectomy uh, device or as aspiration thrombectomy if you have, for example, uh, you know, an endoseal embolization? Yeah, so uh, the, the problem with the angio seal uh, is that it's a very dense collagen plug, very organized, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. the, and your typical aspiration systems will struggle with getting mm -hmm. that out because of the size of the foot plate. So in that kind of situation, uh, you go as big as you can, and uh, I would use uh, the 12 French uh, system, Lightning 12 uh, works, I think, very well mm -hmm. for this. Uh, and you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, typically it's going to lodge at a uh, bifurcation. So uh, mm -hmm. if it embolizes down, it may, it may be in the distal pop sitting there literally on uh, right at the TP trunk. So I, you would take the 12 French catheter all the way down to the pop and then just mm -hmm. turn it on and sit on it and use the extract technique. And many times mm -hmm. we'll be able to pull that thing out intact. The nice thing is okay. the 12 and the 14 French dry seals, the 33 length, are flexible mm -hmm. enough that they go up and over the uh, the uh, iliac bifurcation mm -hmm. very easily. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have any mm -hmm. issues there. And again, a single pre-close will close up to a 14 French hole. Okay, excellent, excellent. That's great to know. I think I have one more question, and then uh, we're going to let you get about your day. So I have a question as well uh, for Jay. If yes. That's okay, Asma. Oh, yes, yes, so please Jay, go ahead. Um, phenomenal talk uh, as usual. Every time I, I listen to you talk, I learn so much and. I want to remind the fellows <clears throat> who are listening that we now have someone in our team who does all of this, Asma Kalik. Um, she's phenomenal. So when you see these patients on your on your call, Thank call you. Asma. She's on call 24-7. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding, Asma. <laughs> um, but I, I, I wondered if you could just reiterate your your technique for thrombus aspiration, this extract technique? Because I know you, you show some slides, but it's so important, I think. And I think it also applies to coronaries and right. how you use penumbra in the coronaries. I often see people with penumbra being, and this catheter is just like going down yeah. all the right. way past the stenosis very quickly. So if you could just reiterate that, please. Yeah. So um, what uh, Azim is referring to is that there are people that are kind of ramming clock. They're, they're going too quick. 
uh, and also not giving time for aspiration to take uh, effect. And you don't necessarily need to go all the way through the occlusion. You go up to the occlusion and then you aspirate. So um, the difference uh, as opposed to the corner is where maybe we'll wait 30 seconds to, to, to a minute with aspiration. In the legs, if you're trying to suck something very hard and organized and allow it to digest, you really want to wait 90 seconds. So what I'll do is I will sit on that clot uh, and uh, and I'll kind of step away, okay? And you, you have to be patient uh, because if you don't allow time for it to digest into the catheter, your aspiration efficiency is going to be reduced or it may be partially in the catheter and then it's going to fall off. So that's a bigger problem where even with a large bore catheter, you've partially aspirated it and now you're pulling it back and then and you're occlusive and then the next thing you know, you're not. And you'll, you start to see blood coming back quite a bit. So you lost the clot and then it rolls its way back down the leg. So to avoid having to do that too many times, you know, use that technique where you go in, you go slowly, you're aspirating, uh, you, uh, but typically if you if you don't have a, a, a blood loss mitigation system, so you do not want to aspirate until you are on the thrombus because you're just going to end up with blood loss. You want to try to minimize that, uh, by being as close to the clot as possible and then turning on the suction force allowing the clot to digest into the catheter, waiting the full 90 seconds, and then pulling it away. I'll tell you that during the pandemic with the COVID type clot, this stuff was so organized that it required even modifications of the technique. I mean, I had one case uh, where literally I just let it sit on it for three minutes and I just kind of, I stepped out of the room. I just sat on it. And that was what was necessary to pull all of this clot into the catheter. And then really, uh, um, uh, uh, get it out of the body very easily at that point too. So patience is key. Uh, uh, you know, they, they use these terms that go slow to finish fast. I mean, I think it's true uh, that uh, that if you allow the, 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 the thrombo aspiration to work and give it enough time, that's when, that's when you're going to have better results. If you go too quick, you're, you're going to end up fragmenting the clot. You're going to end up having to do multiple passes and increase your operative time. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Asma. Great talk Excellent. and great discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jay. Thanks for your time. Of course, Thanks, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for Thank joining you, us.